Shane looks at innovation in public policy and city policies on how they encourage or oftentimes don't even see music. We're going to talk about key issues for cities, including small cities, large cities, tourism cities, and cities in the face of the coronavirus challenge. Please enjoy this podcast. You may not look at your city the same way again, and we'll share ideas about ways that you might be able to look at your city in a whole different light. I'm, I was fascinated looking into the history of sound diplomacy that you're right now in this pivotal spot in bringing together cities as they're dealing with crisis and getting them to talk to each other, which you've done for years. But that's not how you got started. How did you get started with sound diplomacy? Uh, when I founded Sound Diplomacy, I had a part-time job uh, as the music representative for the Canadian Independent Music Association, so kind of the A2IM of Canada. I was the uh, UK and European representative. So what that means is I kind of was responsible for a lot of the export office initiatives. So I had done that for a number of years at the exact same time that I was doing my PhD because I couldn't afford to just do a PhD. <laughs> I know that dance. I know that dance. Yeah. So, and and there's a story behind that. I, you know, I'm not a, I'm not someone who really has chosen to pursue academia, but you know, I love, I love learning. I love trying to understand things and I was given an opportunity to do a PhD. So I did it, but I needed to make money. Um, and I'd been working in the music industry all my life. So prior to that, I worked at a record label, um, I'm actually trained as a music journalist. That's how a lot of people originally, how I met a lot of people originally who I'm still friends with. I wrote for all sorts of magazines that you've heard of. And when I set up uh, the, when I was working at the export office, I was able to travel around Europe and do these showcase festivals and so on and so forth. And Sound Diplomacy, to be frank, was just a way to le further legitimize that when I finished my PhD. So when I finished school, I set up the company and kind of, did what I was doing anyways, just full time with some help. Uh, we, I went into business part uh, business with my um, my partner Jordy, who did the same job for the Catalan government, you know, the in northern Spain. So we became kind of export office, uh, an export office for hire is kind of the best way to think about the origins of sound diplomacy, and that's what we were for three years. Um, we had worked for a number of countries: Colombia, Poland, Canada. Um, even some cities in the U S we worked with and the urbanism side of this and the city side of this just comes out of personal interest. So it's just something that I've always been obsessed with. I'm a bit of a kind of a closet urbanism nerd and bringing those two things together came mainly out of coincidence and also through some influences of, um, friends and partners and board members of mine. So, the story is, is that there was a report that was written in Australia in 2014 um, that was authored uh, in part by one of my advisory board members, a guy named Martin Elborn, who's a very good friend of mine. He works on the Glastonbury Festival here. And that report was, he was tasked uh, alongside a number of wonderful people in Australia um, through the Arts Council and through an academic foundation to investigate why the live music community in Adelaide and South Australia wasn't doing as well as they thought it could. And I am oversimplifying this, by the way, but long story short, that report, which is called The Future of Live Music in South Australia, um, which I really didn't have anything to do with, or very little, um, became the first quote-unquote music cities report um, that I was aware of at the time. And all it did was it outlined all the licensing and regulatory issues in um, Adelaide that made it very difficult for live music to thrive there. There were some really stupid rules that have now been um, uh, reformed, but like you can only play certain music at certain times in certain parts of the city. It's ridiculous. And it goes down to um, not changing the law during prohibition. So it all kind of pivoted from there. Martin then called me up and he's like, listen, Shane, you know, you should start talking to cities uh, knowing that I, um, I had worked in all these countries working for the Canadians. So we started to talk to cities to say, oh, why don't you do this too? And 
we had the door slammed in our face because we didn't know what we were talking about. And it took about six months to think about, think a little bit more with a lot of help and a lot of friends. And that emerged into a, a conference that we ran in 2015 called Music Cities Convention, which we use the infrastructure of The Great Escape, which is a, you know, a big festival that Martin uh, is a co-owner of, you know, and he was the founder of. We essentially did it a day before The Great Escape. And there was a lot of other things happening, I'm sure, at the time. There was um, the Music Cities report that Music Canada was working on at the time. They were doing focus groups around that time. And I participated in one of those. I can have absolutely nothing to do with with that. There were some great people on that, that led that initiative. So, you know, this whole concept of music cities and, and music exchanges kind of developed from there. But if you look historically at this and you do a little bit of digging, you find that this stuff has been going on for ages. You know, there's no inventor here. Um, there was a music cities conference in New Orleans in 2007, I believe, or 2006. That was done by the Responsible Hospitality Institute. Um, Chicago had a music strategy in 2007. There's a long story behind that. Um, and sister city relationships have been in existence since we've had cities and they've been exchanging artists and exchanging music. And I kind of believe we've had this stuff really, as long as we've had cities, I've just tried to, you know, create some processes that cities can understand to understand the value of music in the way they think about value and the way they think about providing services to their citizens. And, and that, uh, is what over time has kind of manifested into my life's work now. So in many ways, this podcast usually looks at technology-led innovation or innovation that is somebody seeing a new need that they come up with a new solution with in a changing or rapidly changing music business and music systems and, and local environments. And we've most recently included Kate Becker talking about the challenges that Seattle and King County have been facing looking at the current crisis. And um, one of the interesting conversations, which we're going to be picking up and at the end of this podcast, we'll share updates on the Amplify Music Conference. A lot of this is that you suddenly have cities facing change and needing to either innovate to accommodate or learn from each other. Are there elements from the work you guys have been doing that help fuel that information, city sharing for, for dealing with the current crisis? Yeah, I think there's a number of issues at play here. Um, the first thing is is that most cities, unfortunately, around the world do not care about music. <laughs> and I'm saying that understanding that and, – and, and by do not care, I want to contextualize that because do – when you write a policy around something, that means that you're setting up a structure and a strategy and a set of rules and norms to govern a certain thing around that policy. So when you don't have a music policy, then music is governed by other things, whether it's governed by public health or by noise or by planning or licensing, things that are designed to deal with other things than music. Most cities have not thought deliberately and intentionally about music. And when they do, it's about singular initiatives historically, like building a particular concert hall or a particular piece of infrastructure. Only recently have cities begun to look at music as an ecosystem. And even so, there's different ways to do that. And a lot of cities have really taken it from an industrial approach, like a thriving traditional commercial music industry means that we have a thriving music ecosystem. And that's also not true. It's part of it, but there's also your planning law and your building codes and your licensing and your public health structures and how you market yourself and tax incentives. And what we have seen is music musicians and the music business have been often not included in a lot of initiatives that cities create to support their citizens, whether it's through incentives, whether it's through public health, whether it's, you know, through uh, other support structures. So I think that what this crisis is showing us and I hope, is that music, in some way, to me, it's so special that it's not special, if that makes any sense. It's kind of like the uncle that you know is in the family, but you don't see, but he's part of the ecosystem, he's supportive, he's wonderful, but not a squeaky wheel. Yeah, well, I, I have an analogy that I use all the time, um, and I, you know, I base the, the way that we 
understand music and communities is very similar to the way that we understand water. And when we all drink a glass of water from the tap, we are rarely thinking about the infrastructure, the pipes and the filtration and the sanitation and the workers and so on and so forth that have to function for that simple act of turning on the tap and getting clean water and drinking it. And if you're lucky enough to have clean water, you know, you don't think about it because clean water is only important when you don't have it. And I believe that music is the same way. So when we listen to a song or we're at an event, um, you know, in the past, and we're immersed in that emotional, physiological kind of, you know, dopamine led experience of loving that particular song, it doesn't matter uh, about anything that's going into that moment happening. Yet the entire supply chain and ecosystem and structure from making the guitars and the equipment um, and mining natural resources all the way through to creating a supply chain across hospitality and event management and so on and so forth. There's a significant ecosystem that makes those moments happen. And I believe that we have to start treating music and the arts in general similarly to the way that we treat other core bits of key infrastructure because It's proven in this crisis that we need it. It's proven that we need music, we need culture, we need art, we need community. And while we put in some infrastructure to support it, the policies just simply do not stack up. And that's when we, that's when I see that, uh, for example, you know, there's money available in relief that was never available as an investment. You know, access to finance for music as a business is far more difficult for most people, especially outside of the Western world in in developing countries. Um, But crisis appeals have raised millions of dollars. And I'm thrilled that they're able to because it just ratifies to me the belief and the value of music. But it doesn't get to the heart of the problem. And the heart of the problem is if we continue to treat music in an ad hoc way, we do not put the appropriate policies and procedures and governance around supporting it, sustaining it, and developing it, then we're never going to innovate, right? We're never going to create an ecosystem in which innovation is possible. We're just going to continue to firefight, for lack of a better word. And when we emerge from triage, when we emerge from this crisis, I hope that we can take lessons to, you know, to spend money to invest in systems so that we're better off the next time something like this happens. And the the thinking around what we're trying to do is to try to explain this value of music, but not explain it that I'm trying to get someone to care about music because it's music. I'm trying to get someone to care about music because it's a piece of infrastructure and as important as any other in a, in a community. And I would say that other parts of music as water, the fact that you know, you're presently in the UK and I'm sitting in the United States and we see in a lot of our press right now, uh, farmers pouring milk on the ground because the marketplace for it has disappeared or it's not connected anymore. And it's harder to see all of the people whose livelihoods are not just venue owner or artist, but are the layers and layers of other people and ecosystems in a city that create the network that delivers the music experience. So it's- yeah, I feel, you know, I think that having worked for, well, I worked for 15 years in the music industry, uh, labels and export and all that stuff. And I feel that we have an incredible opportunity as an industry to innovate by really flipping a switch. And all the switches is to stop focusing exclusively on our internal concept of value how much a stream is worth or how much a particular point is worth and really focus on elevating and, um, and, and, you know, communicating the external concept of value, because I think that this crisis demonstrates that we all need music. If music wasn't with us, life would be immensely worse. And people are turning to it in times of crisis. People are turning to it to raise vast amounts of money, as you can see with, you know, the, Global Citizen Initiative that was announced yesterday, and people are turning to it to for mental health and well-being. And y- you can monetize every bit of this infrastructure and monetize it in a way that is respectful of the community in which you're working in. And I, it just needs a different way of thinking. And I think that this concept of in, including music more in governance, I hope, will catch on. 
Because a lot of places will, you know, they'll set up a music board or a task force of very well-intentioned, smart, engaged people who volunteer their time, who are very well-meaning. Um, but advisory boards in cities can only go so far. And then often you have uh, offices of culture or music or whatever that are not funded in the same way that other city offices are funded. I'm not saying they need to be funded more, but you know we should be looking at having music and cultural representation in offices of resilience and sustainability. We need to be looking in a much more fluid manner in how we govern because everything is tied together. And I think that music provides um, some glue to help you know, understand how we need to reform civic governance and, um, and, and properly innovate our urban spaces so they're better to live in for all of us when we come out of this crisis and how we prepare for the next one. And a lot of the press around music tends to be focused on recorded music numbers and streaming numbers and doesn't tend to look at the local music communities and I know that you've been doing a lot of work in your conferences and reports on that. But also one of the lenses I appreciate of your work is that there's such an intertwining and interdependence on real estate. Who owns the land makes the decisions in many regards, right? And, you know, I want to I want to talk about one of our um, clients and partners, if that's OK. Please, please, please. As an example, I'm not. Uh, I, I don't want to talk about what we do. We we should get judged on what people when people read our work. But mm -hmm. I, I I massively admire the um, the work that's going on in Huntsville, Alabama. So here's a city that I, I love to death because I've been there a lot lately. <laughs> um, but Huntsville is a city of about two hundred odd thousand people. It's known for um, space and uh, and kind of and military technology. That's where NASA is, and that's where um, kind of the second Pentagon is called Redstone. Not sure if your listeners know, but there are there's a second Pentagon, and um, and there's but the city you know historically has not been known as a music or entertainment city, so to speak. It's ninety minutes from Nashville. It's an hour from Muscle Shoals. So there's a lot going on around it that people recognize. But when you say the word Huntsville, often it doesn't come to mind and. And the city has been so deliberate and intentional about incorporating music into its overarching growth plans. So it's building an amphitheater uh, in partnership with a landowner, and that amphitheater is based on attracting new business and providing a place for, you know, to, for residents to go. Um, it's um, its director of planning, city director of planning, is helping uh, run a music board. The music board is leading on COVID-19 resources for the city. The mayor is even on our Slack channel. Like, I know that that's not that possible in lots of places, but it's a it, it's one of the most kind of heartwarming citywide efforts. But it's very, very difficult for us to communicate what Huntsville is doing because it, you know, the, it's not yet contributing, I would say, to how we judge the value of music as an industry. Yet... Mm -hmm. How many more, you know, young kids are going to be really thinking seriously about music because the ecosystem around them is telling them that music is something that is worth thinking about seriously. And this is just one example. There are lots of cities that are doing this that we work in in the U.S. and also that we don't work in that are doing this. Um, some great initiatives independently and with other you know, other uh, consultants too. But I'm, you know... One thing that I've really taken from Huntsville is the fact that they're not treating music um, independently. They're using music as a tool to incorporate it in everything that they're doing. And I think that they, you know, in three, five, ten years' time, I think they'll come out uh, with a much with, – with statistics that will demonstrate how incredibly value it is, valuable it is to incorporate music in city planning this way. I was going to say that I think that some of the richness of this – Part of the conversation is that there's a mythology that to be in the music industry, that you need to be in a very small subset of fairly large cities. And in strategic, I was going to say strategically, cities have the opportunity to rethink, especially if people can be thinking more of working and creating remotely, that maybe there's an enhanced avenue to be attractive as a creative city that may be changed from all this. Yeah, well, I think that, 
you know, music is an a- music is an additive force. So just because a city like Nashville is a music city, obviously Nashville is uh, Nashville will always be. Um, you know, inextricably linked with music in one way or another. But that doesn't mean that any city around it can't be, right? It's, there's different ways to think about this. I think about it infrastructurally. I think about it as an ecosystem. So cities that take music education seriously, cities that rewrite policy and zoning to make it as friendly as possible for music and arts in general to be, um, respected as a sector and to be appreciated by communities you know so music and arts is not simply seen as a non-profit charitable initiative i think any city could do this like i'm just trying to think of a you know a small town we're working in branson missouri right now branson is known for for theater and for show music and all of that but the city is a city of 12 to 15,000 people i think live there it's a small place and yet they're treating music and the arts um, economically as well as a well-being tool as seriously as anybody else. And I don't think they're trying to be anybody but Branson. And so I do believe that there's an unnecessary competition here because I don't see competition. I think every city can take music seriously in their own way. As any city, every city should take the overarching creative and cultural industry seriously in their own way. And they have to think about it in a, in a wider sense and think about it especially in terms of inclusive growth. Right. I don't believe that I have succeeded in any in every regard in this, you know, and I'm speaking as a as a white Canadian. But I believe that the voices that need to be heard in every community are much, much wider than often get heard. And music is a great tool to do that. And, you know, we work really hard in our work to do that, but we're not always successful. And if people think they are, then they're lying. And I think that we. Again, just a city that's being more engaged with its community through music and the arts. It doesn't need to be looking to Nashville or Austin and and wanting to replicate what they have done. And yet there are interesting impacts from being a place that is seen as a music city, which in some ways Branson is in a different regard, but also depending on tourism as part of the ecosystem. Any thoughts on the current decimation of tourism and what this may mean for ways cities might adjust their thinking or innovate to be possibly a more local music city for a while? Yeah, I think there's a couple of positives that could come out of this, Um, notwithstanding the quite frightening, you're right, as you say, decimation of that sector, which is going to impact the music industry as well as many, many other industries. Uh, But one of the things that music tourism tends to prioritize is heritage over living culture, because heritage is an easier story to tell. Living culture is messy. Heritage is ordered. So thinking about how to tell stories of what's happening you know, in the here and now and, and showcasing the talent that a local city has, I think is going to become an opportunity for the cities and places that uh, wish, to, wish to capitalize on that. I think that's one And two, you know, exploring new technologies, everything from virtual tours of museums and archives and attractions and things like that to just more information sharing or more um, artist engagement across cities. Uh, But I wish I had all the answers, but I certainly think that looking inward in this sense, and I mean this not in a political way, but, you know, looking inward to really explore the, the breadth of local talent that you have every city has it, is, an, again, a net benefit for everybody. Every city that puts more money into its music education program is essentially providing free A&R investment for every record label in the world, right? Every, every city that is revising its um, zoning bylaws to uh, when we're allowed in a safe and responsible way um, permit you know events to be done in, in simpler, less expensive ways are essentially, again, creating uh, their own independent incubation program for the live events industry. Like, we have to think about that. We can mutually benefit from each other if we work together more. And cities are, you know, are ground zero for, in, in this. That's why I'm so excited about it. That's why I think that there's so much innovation that, I hope will come out of this crisis. And my last question, um, as we head toward the end of our conversation here, 
So one of the things that I would get as a highlight out of a lot of your and other music cities work that people are doing is that we have a in many cases, a fragile venues ecosystem because of the changing cost structures in cities, et cetera. And so one of the takeaways I get from many cities work is we do need to take a look at our venue economic structures. And we're in the midst of a lot of visibility for artists support right now, but for venues who are going to continue to pay property taxes and real estate for empty halls that were already on the edge, this is a crazy time. Are you seeing things in cities where cities are stepping up and saying, we are here to support venues, or are you seeing things that are needed? I think it's more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. I think that... I think that the definition of a venue is going to have to be liberalized in some regards. You know, speaking from the UK, for example, where we've lost hundreds of community centers due to austerity, each of these community centers in and of themselves was a venue in one way or another. Some of them even um, had makeshift recording facilities in them, which, which kids used and now they no longer can use. I think that there is a level of nostalgia that we all have when, we, when the word venue is used. So we want to protect our venue. We want to protect the venues that we love, the venues that we grew up in, and I'm the same. And I feel that we need a much broader discussion about what the you know community amenity of these venues are so they can be better understood, so there can be better conditions placed on them. Does that answer the question? It broadens the question, which is great, because in many ways, I'm hearing a very complex set of answers from people overall looking at well, we actually might have drops in real estate prices. We could have new structures of venues. We could be having much more of a pop-up culture so that venues become more... I think we're going to be seeing innovation on that front and on shared collaborative spaces that we haven't even touched on yet. Yeah, I agree. I think people will be hungry for live performance in one way or another. That's not specific to music. I think that there will be an onus, I hope, if we have progressive planning authorities in whatever country to, you know, commit those developing land to, you know, building better shell and core of their venues, i.e. when you're developing a venue, make sure that new venues are outfitted for the challenges in which we're facing. So they just basic things like streaming capabilities um, in terms of existing venues and old venues or older venues. I just hope that there will be a reimagining of their value in, in society. In each community, I think that we will now realize, you know, like clean water, it, you know, it only matters when you don't have it and people will return to venues. I think that will take time. And I think that hesitation will continue to breed innovation as restaurants turning to delivery and takeaway and fashion houses making masks instead of clothes, like all sorts of great things are happening. And I think the same thing will happen in our um, in our venues, whatever they are, whether they're restaurants or traditional music venues or community centers or libraries or churches, wherever. Well, Shane, it's been great talking with you. We're at the end of our journey here together. So if people would like to reach out to you to find out more about your work or the insights you have, how would you like them to reach out? Visiting our website's helpful, sounddiplomacy.com. Uh, they can feel free to email me as well. I'm um, Shane at sounddiplomacy.com. Thank you for joining us. Uh, best of luck in your continuing innovations and adventures in this current era. And look forward to talking to you soon. Yeah, thank you for your leadership, Gigi. You're, uh, you're a leader. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a perpetual inquiry person trying to bring people together. So that's my whole thing. Thanks, Shane. Thanks for joining us at Innovating Music. That wraps up our podcast. Please join us at innovatingmusic.org where you can find all our past episodes or keep an eye out for amplifymusic.org, a conference coming up fairly soon that's taking a look at how cities are making changes together in the face of the COVID-19 crisis, as well as things that you might find to bring back to your city and your community from this conference and this conversation. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.